Welcome to Wet Pixel Live. My name is Adam Hanlon. I'm the editor of Wet Pixel. I'm joined today by our regular contributor, Alex Mustard. Hi, Alex. Hi, Adam. Nice to be here. Nice to see you, um, as always. Um, so, we big news um, in the underwater uh, photography equipment front this week is the release of Nauticam's EMWL um, bug eye lens. Um, I think we'll come back to explaining what that means in a minute. Um, and obviously, we thought we'd, we should talk about it because it's very important. Um, and what, uh, we, we, we're very fortunate in that Alex is one of the few people that has actually shot this thing seriously underwater. So he's got very much a kind of first-hand impression on, on what it's about. So, so with that in mind, Alex, tell us about what you thought about EMWL and tell us a little bit about bug eye lenses. Okay, I, I think a um, couple of things first is Bug eye is kind of the colloquial name that underwater photographers use. It doesn't mean anything, really. <laughs> I guess it's supposed to mean a kind of a, a, a bug's eye view of the world, yeah. um, potentially. So these are fish eye or wide angle relay lenses. They're ultimately, um, maybe you've got a picture of the in on what the... Um, I can show you, this, this, is, this is one of them here. So there's actually, this is, a, this is the lower version. Um, mm -hmm. So go on, Alex. And they, yeah, they're basically a wide angle lens at the end of a long optical stick. Um, and the advantage of them is it gives you a very wide angle view, nicely away from your camera, and the small size of the end allows you to then approach a relatively small subject and shoot a small subject in a wide angle scene. So an example that most underwater photographers would immediately get their head around is you can shoot a nudibranch full frame with this lens and have a wide angle background behind it. And as any underwater photographer, as soon as they see, see or hear that, they immediately get excited by them. Mm -hmm. However, that's where your excitement needs to be tempered a little bit because it does become a little bit more complicated after that. And the main limitation of these systems is that to, to create this effect optically is very difficult to do so with high image quality. Compromised, yeah. And, yeah, there, there's a compromise that comes with them. And what I'm excited about the Naughty Cam system is it does seem to be making an effort to overcome that, that optical compromise. And we'll come on to that in a little bit. But I think it's good to backtrack now and yeah. look at this a little bit historically. Yeah. And this is a story that really started 10 years ago, where Enon produced um, com almost, you know, completely out of the blue. No one of us knew it was coming. And they turned up at DEMA um, that year with a, a working version of a bug eye lens. It was the the weirdest thing any of us had ever seen, and it was a fisheye relay lens with a fisheye lens this sort of size at the end of a long stick, and it mounted on the front of a, a 60 mil macro lens mm. on a crop sensor SLR, as it was, it was sort of aimed for then. Mm. Um, it was fixed in a way that was attached for the whole dive, and it gave this amazing perspective. And it was a super, super exciting lens, and I, I shot it a lot. I'll, I'll, I'll drag up a few pictures just to show you, to give you an impression of the shot. So this first shot here is a, a Tom Pop Blenny, um, photographed underneath Swanage Pier where I was diving um, last week, actually. Um, but this picture is from, from 10 years ago. Um, and it allows you to make a, a small foreground subject, a small macro subject as a foreground in a wide angle scene. And one of the unusual things about using this lens, I'll just show you this picture for a bit of fun, is that because the lens is so small, animals are very confident with it. Mm. And actually, this picture here is actually the Blenny attacking the lens. <laughs> so it's a down the throat shot of a, a Tom Plot Blenny. It's not a very good shot. <laughs> no bait was involved. <laughs> no. Not, 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 it's actually quite scary when you're looking through the viewfinder <laughs> yeah. and these great big animals coming and attacking. Um, and, and that Tom Plot shot, the, the, the portrait one, has been on the cover of magazines. But the reality is the image quality from the Inon just really wasn't up to much. It gave you these incredible perspectives, but the images were worth maybe two or three megapixels, yeah. which, you know, to be honest, in a pinch, you can just about print as a full page on the front of a magazine. But you really, you know, you're really pushing the limits of it in, in, in terms of actually having usable images. I'll just show you a few more pictures. These are mostly from the UK. Um, this is a picture up in Scotland of a hermit crab, again, charging towards the camera. It was, you know, really fancying its chances against it. Um, and this picture here is a in Iceland of a, um, a lump fish, a lump sucker, a male lump sucker guarding eggs. And it was great being able to get in amongst the kelp and getting through to the subject and really getting this kind of very, very forced perspective um, shot with it. Yeah. And, okay, it wasn't able to produce images of a quality that you could run double-page spread, yeah. but not every picture gets printed big. 
And these have been useful pictures for me down the years. But ultimately, I stopped using it because the number of subjects it was really good for was relatively small and the optical compromises of what I could do with the images was just just too much for me. Yeah. And so although I used the lens, I actually used to share it with Alex Tattersall. Um, he actually bought the lens and I bought the port mount for it. And the two of us shared, shared the system whenever we, we were, wanted to use it. But actually in the end, we both stopped using it. And he ended, and we ended, and he ended up selling the lens on um, just because we kind of ran out of steam with it. I think with a lot of subjects, I'm just going to show this picture here I took in Komodo with it. It's um, uh, The picture on the left is a wide angle shot taken with a, um, a Takina 10 to 17 behind a mini dome. And the picture on the right is the same frogfish, obviously, shot with the, the bug eye lens. Yeah. And the reality is, the, with the, once the subjects get a little bit bigger, the pictures are so similar in terms of perspective, you're not really gaining anything. Yeah. And it's immediately obvious that one of them looks like a proper photograph and one looks like a, a kid's crayon drawing in terms of image quality. Yeah. Um, and it's not just about sharpness. It's also about highlights blowing out. It's about color rendition of just the, the real technical challenge of making these lenses. Yeah. And I spoke to land photographers. I had a friend who filmed insects for the BBC Natural History Unit. And he said that you know, they gave them amazing perspectives, these relay lenses for fisheye, for insect photography, but they could only use them for relatively few shots in the show because the pictures couldn't be graded, couldn't be classified as HD. Yeah because they just didn't have enough resolution and yeah. TV shows have to have a certain percentage of HD to be called an HD show. Yeah. So if an HD is just a few megapixels as well. So, and you know, they were ultimately, and I sort of gave up on the idea then because I just felt that this idea was so limited optically that it was never going to be able to produce really high quality still work. Um, but I think that's, uh, that seems to have been changed. And I think Certainly. you've had some experience with a, a newer design that seems to change that. Yeah, again, I'm going to backtrack a little bit because Blue Planet 2, I think it was, um, wanted an endoscopic lens or a, a bug eye lens um, and actually went out and built one. They had they had a two or three, no one's quite sure, um, of these lens custom built um, for, the, for the production. And that was exactly to get around what you mentioned, Alex, is the fact that they couldn't shoot the existing lens that they could buy. They couldn't shoot and get HD. Um, so they actually had these things built. And they called them the scope, scope one, scope two. And I think there was a scope three. I may have that wrong, but um, and we shot with the scope two at, at, at Fun Enough at Cape and Ray um, on the, when they were launching Blue Planet. So, um, and you know, that that was their get around, but that was a very expensive way of getting around it. Now, um, in addition to calling them bug eyes, people also call them endoscopes, but I don't, um, encourage anyone to do the endo part of that with yeah. one of these. Yes, no, best not to. Um, no, yeah. Yeah. Endo scope means something rather different. Yeah, yes, yes, medically certainly. Um, right. So, um, so about two years ago, what are we now, 2020, 2018, um, at the end of 2018, um, uh, company Loa, Loa um, released this, which is an F14 two times macro relay lens, um, is what they call it. Um, and Different to the design of the in-on one, um, this is a um, it's an it's a complete lens. This is a, this is one that fits on my Nikon's. Um, so, so that has, goes straight on the it camera. Has, it has a Nikon um, F mount on it. Um, mm -hmm. So obviously, again, it was F mount. You can put it on Z mount. Um, it uh, it's manual focus. It's manual aperture. Um, I'll say f fourteen. Um, so you know you've got you've got um, aperture and focus rings on the. On the lens barrel, um, it's waterproof itself to thirty meters. Um, it actually does also have a little LED light in the end. I don't know if you can see that um, down the end yet. There's yeah, little, just about. Yeah, there's a little LED light, um, um, which actually I have to say I've never used um, underwater. Um, and various manufacturers produced um, ports that would attach to this, basically with a gland that comes around the barrel of the lens, um, and then a port that mounts onto the housing. So you mount it like a conventional lens onto the camera. Um, and then the port obviously provides the waterproofing part. Um, and Loa did a fantastic job and actually managed to get one FedEx to me to um, Atlantis at Puerto Galera for, um, for the Atlantis Image Makers last year. Um, and it actually arrived in um, amazingly in the Philippines. It was a fantastic job. And I brought the Nauticam um, port adapter with me and I managed to shoot it. Um, as I say, different to the in on one in that the lens element is a 14 mil rectilinear wide angle lens. So unlike the um, the in-on version, um, the idea is that it, it's not presenting a, a forced perspective fisheye look. Um, 
I, I know it's been used um, also by video guys quite a lot. Um, obviously, the video guys, the the, the fisheye look is a is a challenge. So the rectilinear look makes is, is easy to use with video. But again, like I said, I've got a few pictures I shot with it. Um, and the first one here is, is a fairly common subject. It's just a seahorse on, on the seabed um, at, again, at, at, at Puerto Galera. Um, the difference, was, I'm not sure, could you get this picture with a, a conventional lens setup? Possibly. Um, but I, I think the fact that the lens, I was able to get so close to the sand with it, it was right down on the sand, um, or the lens element was right down on the sand. So I'm, I'm actually effectively almost looking up at the seahorse, which is a, you know, it's hard to do with a, a certainly with a conventional SLR, maybe with a very small camera, it's possible. But, um, actually, one thing I don't like about these long relay lenses is that long length actually makes it very hard to get an upward camera angle yeah. because you, you need an, an animal on a slope basically to get an upward camera and angle there's a there's a great gizmo that gates the 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 that their um video housing manufacturers have vented which is basically a tiltable mirror that you attach to the end of the lens um and and it obviously produces your image it's a mirror image um mm. and and you can angle the mirror at whatever angle actually it's, it's a really nice gizmo now they gave me one to test at dima last year and unfortunately thanks to the lockdown i've not actually managed to get in the water but i do need to do that um so yeah anyway the 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 the, the next couple of images um and there's a pair of images here of uh flamboyant cuttlefish this flamboyant cuttlefish was hunting across the sand um hunting across the seabed and, and very similar to what alex mentioned about the blennies earlier um was actually completely unfazed by the presence of me and the lens which is unique because even though the lens is some distance away or the end tip of the lens is some distance away there's still me and a camera housing behind it it's not that far away but it was completely unfazed um and in actual fact when, when i first put these images out on the internet and um, there was quite a lot of talk about the fact that some of the uh, there, there was some quite blurred sections in in the um, the cuttlefish's tentacles and the reason for that is they're actually on the lens element you know the the the, 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 the there's a two inch um mac uh, minimum focus distance uh, sorry two centimeter uh, minimum focus distance with lens and it, it was it was the, the tentacles are on the end of the lens um but again you know it's a very unique perspective it literally the lens is within the animal's tentacles um uh, mm -hmm. color wise you know it's fine I, I, because it's rectilinear lens the corners are okay um and and um I think that it's challenging to get this lens um, set up correctly um, because it's manual focusing, manual aperture. Obviously, when you stop down to get depth of field, um, you therefore also can't see anything through the viewfinder. Or, as I discovered, the way the way I ended up shooting is using live view and using the peaking mode to try and get the sharpness on it, um, which is it's a it's a compromise. It's not an ideal solution, but it, it did work. But it's hard to use. And the last yeah. image, basically, is, is the one that Alex started off talking about. This is a nudie bank. It's one of the uh, Kubiana, I think it's called, the Nembrothers, um, moving across its favorite food, some, some sea squirts. Um, and, you know, what I really liked about it, I think this shows what this, these types of lens can do. And I'm putting the animal right in its environment and showing the animal within its environment rather than it being just focused on the animal it's also showing where the animal lives and i think that's a really powerful thing um as a photographer as an underwater photographer and, and a very and, and and i think that's really the, what what these tools do for me i think um, i think that's 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 exactly what they should do anyways One i didn't mention about the in on which you reminded me of when talking about using live view mm. is 10 years ago the live view was mm. either non-existent or not usable on the cameras mm. But the other problem of using the, the in on one is that the, the view through it was reversed. So <laughs> when you look through, if you wanted your subject, it was off center. You had to move the lens the opposite way to the that's, way you thought. That's tough in order to get it. Now, although that sounds really mind scrambling, actually, after a dive or two, you got very used to it. And it was actually no deal. You realized when you were moving it, I'm going the wrong way. And you just went the other way. Yeah. It really wasn't as big a deal as. It, it, but it was very weird when you first used it. And the fact that you've got, a, I guess the fact that you've got a relatively wide view on the lens makes it easy. If you had a very narrow view, you'd lose your subject continuously and then move the wrong way. Yeah. And then, and then with the in-on, the, the optics were so kind of hazy to look through when the lens aperture was open yeah. that when you, you couldn't be sure of the focus yeah. and you basically, the autofocus wouldn't work very well, so you would generally just use a fixed focus yeah. and then shoot um, a number of frames so that you could select afterwards on sharpness. Yeah. Um, and I guess, you know, you should bring this up to date now with, with the Naughty Cam. Yeah. Would you say that the, the one I can't pronounce, the Lower, Lower, um, 
That that I'm, is quite sharp, isn't it? In the middle of the frame. It's sharp in the middle of the frame. Yeah, I mean there, there is a justifiable argument. It's not brilliant in the corners, but but the middle of the frame is yeah, very sharp. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, sharp as in as sharp as a prime lens, or, or just sharp. Um, I would say sharp as a prime lens. Certainly sharp. Yes, sharp as a prime lens. And so it's a good detail. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's a massive change then in the yeah. the time from the in on, which was never really very sharp anywhere. Yeah. Um. But what I do see when I look at the the pictures from that is there's kind of that crayony look of the you know the highlights aren't as well controlled and the the shade you know as normal the colours aren't rendered quite like a normal picture. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, and I think that for me was the thing that immediately struck me when I went to try the naughty cam lens is that the image quality was 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 superb. And I've only had the chance to try a pre-production unit, and I know that naughty cam have continued to refine the design since the version I tried, but the version I tried was phenomenal. The, the Nauticam one is, I think, interesting in a few ways. First of all, Nauticam have really like thrown the optics toolbook at developing it. Mm. And my understanding of it is that it's got 30 lens elements inside this wow. thing. And that's just an external lens that then goes in front of, it's designed for a, <laughs> a Nikon 105 or a Canon 100 to be behind it on a full frame camera. Yep. So you've got your normal autofocus aperture controlling lens. Yep. And then this is a wet lens that goes on front of it, yep. fully corrected for those boundaries at both ends wow. with all this amazing optics. And I think one of the reasons it's been a little bit slow to come out is that some naughty camera basically said, we want the best possible glass, no expense spared. And it's really hard to get hold of that really expensive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and there'll be production lead times and stuff, I guess, on it as well. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's, you know, it, although they were, I think they've been showing it for a couple of years now. Yeah. At the show, yeah. It's finally, they're going to source all the glass they want for it. Yeah. And you know, this thing has got more fancy glass than a massive telephoto lens. Yeah. The other thing that's really nice about it is it's, inter, it's got interchangeable segments. Yeah. So you can use it without the long relay if you want. And therefore, you end up with a flipped image. Yeah. But if you've got a, a viewfinder or a monitor, you can always flip the monitor. Yeah. Um, or you can just deal with the fact it's backwards because it's actually not that difficult. Yeah. But if yeah. you are using it in its standard configuration with the relay, um, you've also then got three end pieces which give different angles of view from it. And I'm not going to necessarily cover all of them now. Um, but my memory is there's a 130 degree and um, a 100 degree one. And I think the other one was maybe 60. Eight. No, 60. Yes. Um, I didn't find the 60 one that usable, but it, it's, a, it's, enabled, it, it's able to do super close macro with it. Mm. And I think that was probably more that I didn't have the subjects where I was testing it in Cayman mm. to find it useful for that. The one I used the most in Cayman where it was kind of a bit more normal reef subjects was the 130 degree one, mm. which is actually aimed a little bit more at videographers than still photographers. Right. But I really like that one. And I was going to show you a couple of shots with it now. This is um, a picture of one of the subjects I could get to come and attack it was a territorial damselfish. So this is a territorial damselfish um, attacking the lens. <laughs> as it's um, and I'm just going to show you a zoom in now of its eye. And that is as crispy sharp, zoomed in all the way in as you could want from any image. Yeah. And that image quality from this lens goes corner to corner. And it's got that rendering that looks like a proper SLR picture. Yeah. It's not got that, you know, um, blown highlights, colors badly rendered. You know, it just looks fantastic. And there's a few other shots of the same species of damselfish. Um, this one with a, with a diver behind. Um, and, you know, it really gives a, a really, really good image quality, a very usable perspective. And obviously, I can't wait to take it on a muck diving trip. Yeah. And... For me, I'm super excited about this lens because I think the excitement that we all felt 10 years ago when the Inon lens was announced and then the disappointment we all felt when we realized that, yes, it gave this amazing perspective, but the image quality just wasn't usable enough. Mm. And then um, the, the low, uh, I, I still struggle with, um, that you've tried is also a little bit image quality compromised, maybe not sharpness, yeah. but in other areas. And it's quite a hard lens to shoot because of the limitations of being manual focus and fixed aperture yeah, yeah. and all that. Yeah. I think all these things are promising to be realized in this naughty cam lens. And the fact that it's got this modular design, there may even be the potential in the future for them to add more optics to it. Yeah. So you buy it now and you buy one or two or three of the options. You may even have future choices in the, in, you know, more choices in the future. I find it really exciting and I really can't wait to get in the water and try it. Yeah. Hopefully when we get to go to Lembe later this year with wet pixel. Yeah. 
blasting away with it. I think it's a great system. So yeah, really exciting times and really looking forward to, to getting my hands on one again. I think, um, I think that, that, thanks, Alex. I mean, that, that's a very unique perspective because you're saying you're one of the few people in the world that shot it, so um, underwater. So, so that's really, really good. I think um, we we we'll probably run another episode shortly about some of the how to shoot these lenses. I think that's obviously a good idea. Um, mm. So, um, so yeah, uh, Alex's pictures are all available on his website at amustard.com. How, have you tagged them E-W-E-M-W-L or not? No, I haven't. First of all, actually, I spent ages calling it the wrong thing. I kept <laughs> right. calling it the E-N-W-L. Uh-huh. So, um, but uh, they may be tagged to that, but obviously it's not in the EXIF because it's a wet lens. Of course, yeah. So it's not easy to find on a searchable thing. But the pictures were all in Cayman, and they were all this year. So if you type Cayman, my newest Cayman pictures will come up first, yeah. and you'll spot them in there. there you go. They're the ones with the weird perspective. So yeah, I know, but that'll give you an idea of the quality of the lens. I think possibly is unique. Um, yeah. Certainly, if you if for my stuff, if you go onto um, onto um, I don't know actually my website, but if you go onto onto Facebook, for example, and look around at um, Atlantis Image Makers 2019, that tag is they're all tagged with that. So and they okay. come up on there as well. Um, so thank you very much Alex um, we'll chat to you again very soon about some of the technical aspects of shooting these lenses um, I'd like to thank our um, sponsor for today um, sorry I'll just get this screen changed I'd like to thank our sponsor for today which is Bunaken Oasis so thank you very much um, and please feel free to subscribe to this channel if you'd like to get notified when we release future episodes um, please like this video assuming you enjoyed it and please add suggestions for future topics in the conversation. Thank you very much, and I'm to see you soon.